good afternoon. Uh, my name is Quinn Meekham. I am a professor here at BYU. Uh, I teach uh, political science and Middle East studies. And I'm so delighted uh, to introduce uh, our first panel of the afternoon, uh, which is on contemporary Islamic politics. Uh, just as a note for those of you that have a physical program in your hand, that se session six, which will follow this session immediately after at 1.30 is titled Probing Islamic Diversity, Sunni, Shia, and Beyond. That, that panel uh, will begin at 1.30. Uh, contemporary Islamic politics uh, is a fascinating topic. It's one that I've, I, I've been interested in for many years. Uh, we will be exploring in this panel uh, several questions. As noted in your program, how do Islamic interests and perspectives influence political actions and outcomes in Muslim-majority countries? In what ways have political actors used Islamic institutions, language, and culture to further their political goals? When do actors in Islamic movements choose to participate in elections versus other forms of political participation? What is the relationship between uh, democratic forms of governance and uh, religious politics in the Muslim world. Uh, this panel is going to uh, examine uh, some of the bigger questions in Islam and politics as well as some recent developments, including the development of new opportunities for political competition in some countries and the sustained persecution of Islamic political actors in others. And I'm so delighted to welcome uh, our two panelists. Um, they are both um, friends and colleagues of mine. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Tarek Masood. Tarek Masood is a professor of public policy at, at, and the Sultan Qaboos bin Said of Oman, professor of international relations at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he's also the faculty chair of the Middle East Initiative at the Kennedy School. Uh, his research uh, which, of which I'm a fan, uh, focuses on political development in Arabic-speaking and Muslim-majority countries. Uh, recently, he's been the author of an important book on political Islam in Egypt called Counting Islam, uh, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt. Uh, our second speaker uh, is uh, Shadi Hamid. Uh, Shadi Hamid is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for Middle East Policy uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's the author of several books on political Islam, including Islamic Exceptionalism, How the Struggle Over Islam is Reshaping the World, uh, which was shortlisted for the 2017 Lionel Gilbert Prize. Um, he's the co-editor with Will McCants of Rethinking Political Islam and the co-author of Militants, Criminals, and Warlords, The Challenge of Local Governance in the Age of Disorder. Um, his first book, Temptations of Power, Islamists, and a Liber Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East, uh, was named a Foreign Affairs Best Book of 2014. Um, he uh, has published often in the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, and uh, appears in a, a number of media programs in the United States. Uh, it's my uh, delight to welcome both of our speakers, and we will begin with Tarek Masood. Thank you. Okay, first, I will take off my mask. Second, I will start my timer so that I do not take uh, more than my allotted time. Uh, thank you, everybody. In this country, we take, I have some slides that uh, I'm hoping somebody will throw up on the screen momentarily. There's nobody manning the audiovisual desk, so, okay. Well, okay, uh, so in this country we take for granted that we get to choose our leaders in free and fair elections, and that our freedoms to speak and to gather and to think or not think, whatever we like, are enshrined in a constitution, encoded in our laws, and protected by the state. Now, very few of these things, however, are true in countries where the dominant religion is the religion that I and my family have practiced for more than a thousand years, Islam. So at this point, I would be showing you slide one. Oh, there it is, okay. So there are 48 majority Muslim countries on planet Earth, okay? 
Uh, more than 1.5 billion people live in those countries. And according to the organization Freedom House, which rates countries based on their degrees of civil and political liberty, in 2020, more than half of the world's Muslim-majority countries, that's 27 of those 48, were not free. These are places where leaders are not meaningfully chosen by or accountable to the citizenry, and where violations of individual freedom and dignity are common and daily occurrences. Now, another 20 Muslim-majority countries, or about 40% of the total, are rated by Freedom House as partly free. Now, these are places like Senegal or Kosovo or Indonesia, where you do have routine elections and you do have a degree of individual liberty, but it falls short of fully fledged freedom, right? So if you have elections, they're typically marred by irregularities. Opposition party politicians are typically harassed by the state. The military might have more political power than it should. And rights that exist on paper may be poorly enforced in reality. And while you definitely prefer to live in a partly free country than in a not free country, you wouldn't confuse a partly free country for the fully fledged democracy of our dreams. Now, in fact, of all of the Muslim majority countries that uh, Freedom House um, uh, rated in, in, in 2020, only one was rated as free, and that is Tunisia, which is a tiny country of about 11 million people in northern Africa, and that's the country, the only country that emerged from the so-called Arab Spring in 2011 with the democracy that its people have called for. Now, if you've been paying attention to the news, you know that even Tunisia might not stay this way for long because you know that earlier this summer, the president of Tunisia, a former law professor named Qais Saeed, fired the prime minister, suspended the country's parliament, and imposed emergency rule. Just last month, he decided that he was going to bypass the constitution entirely and serve as both president and legislature in one, and he said he could issue laws as if he were a one-man parliament, and any decision that he made would be above judicial review. In other words, when Freedom House updates its data for the year 2021, unless one of the not free or partly free Muslim majority countries experiences a dramatic improvement, we're going to be in a situation where not one Muslim majority country on the planet counts as a free country. Now, why is this the case? Why at this late date in human history are there no Muslim majority countries that are unambiguously democratic? Now there are lots of answers that scholars have answered to uh, have offered to these questions, but since this is a conference on Islam I'm, and I've been asked to speak about Islam and politics, I want to discuss two potential answers that directly implicate the faith. And just to be clear at the outset, I actually think both of these answers are wrong, okay? Um, <laughs> But I want to spend time on these wrong answers because they're the first ones you're going to hear when you're out in the world and somebody starts talking about this problem of uh, attaining genuine liberal democracy in the Muslim world. So the first wrong explanation is that Muslims don't have democracy because they don't actually want it. And the idea here is that the reason that they don't want it is because their religion teaches them not to want it. Um, and uh, it inculcates the idea here, this is not my argument, the idea here is that Islam inculcates in its followers a belief in an autocratic model of leadership and that Muslims consequently want to be ruled by a caliph who governs according to the Quran and who's accountable only to God and not to the petty wants and whims of a fickle and imperfect citizenry. Now, one Western scholar who offered such a view was this handsome gentleman. Um, his name was uh, Eli Kaduri. He was a British uh, historian. And in a 1992 book entitled Democracy and Arab Political Culture, he offered one of the most uh, authoritative statements of this view. And he said, there's nothing in the political traditions of the Arab world which are the political traditions of Islam. I'm quoting him here, okay? Maybe I should do accents so you know who I'm quoting. Uh, 
which might make familiar, there's nothing in these traditions that might make familiar or indeed intelligible the organizing ideas of constitutional and representative government, the notion of a state as a specific territorial entity which is endowed with sovereignty, the notion of popular sovereignty as the foundation of governmental legitimacy, the idea of representation, of elections, of popular suffrage, of political institutions being regulated by laws laid down by a parliamentary assembly, of these laws being guarded and upheld by an independent judiciary, the ideas of the secularity of the state, of society being composed of a multitude of self-activating autonomous groups and associations, all of these are profoundly alien to the Muslim political tradition. A similar argument was offered by this uh, gentleman, the late Harvard scholar, who was referenced in uh, John es uh, es uh, Esposito's talk, Samuel Huntington. Uh, in his 1993 book on uh, democratic transitions, which is a better book than The Clash of Civilizations, he also worried that there's something about Islam that makes its followers undemocratic. And he wrote that Islam, and again I'm quoting, he said, Islam rejects any distinction between the religious community and the political community. Hence, there is no equipoise between Caesar and God, and political participation is linked to religious affiliation. Fundamentalist Islam demands that in a Muslim country, the political rulers should be practicing Muslims, Sharia should be the basic law, and the ulama, the religious scholars, should have a decisive vote in articulating or at least reviewing and ratifying all governmental policy. To the extent that governmental legitimacy and policy flow from religious doctrine and religious expertise, Islamic concepts of politics differ from and contradict the premises of democratic politics. Now, both Kaduri and Huntington wrote more than 20 years ago, but I'd be remiss if I left you with the impression that this idea that Islam and democracy are incompatible is something that you'd find only in the older scholarly literature, because in fact, as you know, the idea is one that you increasingly hear out of the mouths of politicians. This is Geert Wilders, a right-wing politician from the Netherlands, the head of the third largest party in his country's parliament, and in a 2009 speech in the US, he said, Islam wants to dictate every aspect of life and society and prohibit individual, political, and religious rights and freedoms. Islam is not compatible with our Western civilization or democracy, nor will it ever be. Today, one of the most talked about potential candidates for France's upcoming presidential election is this guy, uh, Eric Zemmour, who is famous in his country as a critic of immigration, particularly the immigration of Muslims from uh, uh, Northern and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in a 2016 book, he said, Islam is incompatible with secularism, incompatible with democracy, and incompatible with Republican government. Now, I don't want you to leave here thinking that it's only just Westerners who say things like this. So this uh, handsome gentleman is Omar Suleiman, who for many years was Egypt's uh, spy master. And in January of 2011, as you probably know, uh, Egyptians took to the streets during the so-called Arab Spring, calling for the dictator of the country at the time, Hosni Mubarak, to resign. And Mubarak appointed this guy, Omar Suleiman, as vice president and dispatched him to go and deal with the protesters. So for a while, Omar Suleiman was the face of the government. And during that time, he sat down with uh, ABC's Christian Amanpour for an interview. And Amanpour was asking him, you know, why do you think the people are rebelling? And Omar Suleiman said, oh, they're just being roused by outsiders. Okay, so I'm now going to uh, relate, I'm going to uh, share with you a snippet of their conversation. So Amanpour says to him, well, in many parts of the Arab world, there's no democracy. Don't you think that the young people in today's world connected to the internet, seeing everything that they see, don't you think that this comes from their hearts, this rebellion, in other words? And Omar Suleiman says, it's uh, okay to talk together, but it's not their idea. It comes from abroad. And Amanpour says, uh, do you believe in democracy? And Suleiman says, for sure. Everybody believes in democracy. But when will you do that? when the people here will have the culture of democracy. The idea being that the people of his country culturally were not predisposed to democracy. Now, I know most of you guys are hip young students, so you probably don't need much convincing from me that anything old guys like this say is wrong or bigoted or worse. 
But in fact, right, um, I, you know, typically uh, an academic like me doesn't have the luxury of counting on the goodwill of ideologically congenial young people, and I think that's a good thing. So when you're listening to me say, I actually think all of these guys are wrong when they say that Islam and democracy are not compatible, you should be asking yourself, uh, how does he know uh, that they're wrong? How can he prove it? In other words, you know, in God we trust, all others bring data. So how would we prove that Islam and democracy are compatible? How can I convince you that the reason that there is no Muslim majority democracy is not because uh, Muslims don't want democracy? So one thing we could do, or that Islam teaches Muslims not to want democracy. So one thing we could do is we could go pouring through Islam's holy texts. We could read the Quran, which we believe the word, to be the word of God, and the Hadith, which are the collected sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, and we could pull out of those texts passages that suggest a democratic character to Islam. So I could point, for example, to certain verses in the Quran, and I could say, for in these verses, God speaks about the importance of shura, or consultation, right? So in one verse, the Prophet Muhammad is commanded, fil amr, right? consult your followers in important affairs. And I could say the notion here is that Islam doesn't countenance arbitrary decision-making by rulers. It obligates rulers to seek the consent of the governed and this is a pro-democratic principle within Islam, okay? I'm not gonna do that, and I'm not gonna do it for two reasons. First of all, I'm not a scholar of holy texts, and I believe that interpretation of those texts requires us to do more than just scour it for phrases that support our uh, pre-existing notions. But secondly, I won't try to convince you that Islam's holy texts have an essentially democratic or anti-democratic uh, character, because I know that for every supposedly pro-democratic fragment I could pull out of them, you could pull out, if you wanted to argue uh, against me, a supposedly anti-democratic uh, um, uh, sentiment. So for example, there are hadith or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that one could plausibly interpret as commanding believers to show complete obedience to authority, which of course we think of as being opposed to democracy. Hadith 176 in volume 9 of book 88 of Sahih Bukhari, which is one of the most authoritative, the most authoritative collection of the Prophet's sayings, we're told the Prophet said to his followers, whoever disapproves of something done by his ruler, then he should be patient. For whoever disobeys the ruler, even a little, will die as a pagan. Okay. Now, Professor Brown described yesterday some of the disciplined work that you would need to do to to, to interpret a hadith like that uh, properly, and it's quite perilous, I think, for a layman like myself to do that. So instead of pouring through ancient texts to figure out what Muslims believe about democracy, I think we should just ask them, right? Um, what they believe about democracy. And we're in luck because people have already done this. Um, there uh, is a massive project, multi-year project, called the World Values and European Values Surveys. And since 1981, these surveys have interviewed more than 640,000 people in 115 countries in order to discover their political, economic, and moral values and attitudes. And crucially for our hypothesis, uh, for our um, purposes, they also recorded the religions of every one of their respondents. So this sample of these, you know, 600 and, almost 650,000 people includes almost 100,000 Muslims, almost 170,000 Catholics, almost 80,000 Protestants, and uh, almost 75,000 Orthodox Christians. And these surveys over the years have asked a lot of questions about democracy. And what I want to do is use some of that data to explore whether Muslims answer questions about democracy in ways that are different from members of these other denominations. So, so um, one of the questions that they ask is they say, I'm going to describe a bunch of political systems, and I'm going to ask, so they show up at your door, and they say, you know, would you be willing to do a survey, etc.? Okay, the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to ask you about different types of political systems, I'm going to ask you what you think about each of them as a way of governing your country, and you tell me if it's very good, fairly good, fairly bad, or very bad, right? And so the first political system, they say, is having a democratic political system. What do you think? Good, fairly good, etc.? Here's how most people, you know, everybody, when you pool the whole sample, you don't break it down by religion, you find that more than 90% of people say that it's very good, right? So, so, oh, sorry. So this, the big line is, you know, about almost 50% of people. And then 40% of people say it's fairly good. That's the second one. So the majority of people think that it, having a democracy is very good. What we want to
to know, though, is are Muslims appreciably different from other groups? So we want to break this down by uh, religious group. So here's what it looks like for Muslims. Okay, again, we're, st we're in great shape. Fewer than 10% of Muslims think that, that are sampled, you know, uh, in this uh, massive multi-year project thought that democracy was very bad or fairly bad, okay? Um, actually better than Roman Catholics, okay? Uh, better than uh, the Eastern Orthodox Christians. The only people who really uh, beat the Muslims here are the Protestants, okay? The Protestants uh, are more, um, are, are more uh, pro-democratic. But if you look at this, you would say, okay, Muslims clearly uh, think democracy is a good thing, okay? Obviously, you don't want to draw a conclusion from one question. So another question that they ask, uh, you know, again, political systems, what do you think of them? How about a political system where you have a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections? Is that very good, fairly good, et cetera? And if you look at the way people break down, you know, it's certainly true that more Muslims say it's very good than Roman Catholics or Protestants. They still outperform, though, the, the Orthodox who express a more authoritarian view. However, the important thing to note here is that the majority of Muslims actually think that it would be very bad or bad to have a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament or election. So I could wrap up this part of my talk here and say, well, clearly I've just showed you incontrovertible evidence that Islam and democracy are compatible because clearly Muslims want democracy. Um, but we'd still have what I call the Kim Jong-un problem. And this is the problem uh, that democracy actually means a lot of different things to different people. And we're often not talking about the same thing when we talk about democracy. And so why do I call this the Kim Jong-un problem? It's because the country that this man uh, presides over, uh, and he's one of the world's great uh, despots in case you didn't know, is called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Right? But it's not democratic in any ways that are recognizable to us. So it's possible, plausible, perhaps, that Muslims are like Kim Jong-un. Right? That is, when a Muslim says she's in favor of democracy, the idea, the thing that's in her head that she's calling democracy is very different from what you or I might call uh, democracy. So luckily, this survey helps us figure that out. So one of the things that they did is they... Uh, presented people with a variety of institutions and policies and arrangements, and they said, tell me for each of these things how essential you think it is as a characteristic of democracy on a scale of one to 10, where one means it's not an all essential characteristic of democracy, and 10 means it's definitely an essential characteristic of democracy. And so the first one is, the, is people choose their leaders in free and fair elections. Just very quickly, how many people would say, one, this is not an essential characteristic of democracy? Okay, how many people would say 10? Put up your hand, don't be shy. Yeah, there you go, okay, good. So, um, and here's how Muslims, Catholics, uh, Orthodox Christians, and Protestants answer this question. All of them understand choosing your leaders in free and fair elections is an essential characteristic of democracy. So, so far, so good. Okay, another question, uh, is, okay, what about this? Civil rights protect people's liberty from state oppression. Okay, um, and how many of us would say that this is an not an essential characteristic of democracy? No hands, essential? Put up your hand, let's be participatory. Okay, um, and here's how it breaks down by uh, the different religious groups. Again, the plurality of people in all of these communities understand that this is an essential characteristic of democracy and the distributions don't look terribly uh, different. Okay, so far so good. Um, here's another one. Religious authorities interpret the laws. Okay, how many people here would say this is 10, an essential characteristic of democracy? Okay, how many people say one, it's not an essential characteristic of democracy? Okay, a lot of, a lot of hands up on one. Okay, um, just, uh, just for fun, by the way, there are 66 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in this sample. So 650,000 people, only 66 LDS members. But I thought it would be interesting to throw up their pooled answers to this question, okay? And here's what these, uh, their answers look. So they understand it's not essential. By the way, not a single member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who was sampled in this survey uh, gave it a 10, right? So they, the, at least these folks all understood this is not essential to democracy. Okay, how does this look 
for the different religious communities that we are examining. Um, here's the distribution. Okay, so you can see that most Roman Catholics understand, the plurality of Roman Catholics understand it's not essential, Protestants, Orthodox, but with Muslims, the distribution looks a little bit different, right? Now, I wanna be very clear, like this is that red line I've just thrown up, that's the midpoint. More Muslims are to, what is that? That's the left, I think, they're to the left of that. In other words, they are on the side of understanding that this is not quite intrinsic to democracy but it's only a little bit more than half. And certainly if you look at the extremes, right, you would see that you know, many um, fewer Muslims understand that religious authorities vetting the laws is essential to democracy than Catholics or Protestants or, ultra, or uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians do. And similarly, many more Muslims think that religious authorities vetting the laws is an essential characteristic of democracy than do uh, Christians uh, of the various denominations. Okay, so what does all this add up to, okay? So first, I think what I've showed you is that Muslims definitely wanna live in democratic systems in which people choose their leaders through free and fair elections. They don't wanna live in regimes governed by strong men who don't bother with legislatures or voting. And they actually understand that the protection of individual liberties is a core feature of what democracy is. And so in a lot of these things, they're very similar to uh, uh, members of the Christian faith. And that gives the lie to the arguments of people like Eli Kaduri and Samuel Huntington who said that they're somehow uh, different. But it also, the data suggests that the Muslim majority democracy wouldn't necessarily look identical to what we've gotten used to in the West. In a Muslim majority democracy, citizens might actually be more comfortable with having there be room for religion in the setting of policy and in the writing of legislation. And though that's not ideal from the standpoint of a classical liberal like myself, it's certainly a far cry from the idea that Muslims aren't capable of or interested in having any kind of democracy at all. So I think we could rule out that argument. Okay, in the seven minutes I have left, I wanna come to the second explanation, wrong explanation uh, number two. And um, that explanation is that because Muslims are religiously conservative in the ways that you just saw on that last slide, even though they may want democracy, if you give them the vote, they're gonna use it to vote in religiously conservative Islamist parties that wanna legislate Islamic law and who will use the democratic process to get into power, after which they'll set about dismantling democracy and erecting a theocracy. And the emblematic statement of this fear actually came from former uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs, Edward Jurigian. In uh, 1992, he said that the United States was, quote, suspect of those who would use the democratic process to come to power only to destroy that very process in order to retain power and political dominance. For while we believe in the principle of one person, one vote, we do not support one person, one vote, one time. Now, the historical context for this speech is that it came six months after the military in Algeria, which is a North African country, stepped in to disrupt democratic elections that looked like they were gonna hand a sweeping victory to an Islamist party called the Islamic Salvation Front. And the U.S. and other Western powers, particularly France, supported that move because they believed, and, and not entirely unreasonably, that the Algerian Islamists were not interested in democracy and would erect a repressive religious state. And so what they did was they traded the possibility of a repressive Islamic state for the certainty of a repressive non-Islamic one. Now, Many scholars in my field have spent a lot of time trying to determine whether suspicions of Islamist parties' democratic commitments are misplaced. So we'll study the platforms and the documents of Islamist parties in order to determine whether they're telling the truth when they say that they want democracy. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Hamid, will talk a little bit about this. My view is, well, when Islamists say they want democracy, some of them are telling the truth and some of them are lying. 
Uh, incidentally, that's also what I believe about Republicans, it's what I believe about Democrats, and it's what I believe about pretty much every politician. So instead of trying to peer into Islamist hearts in order to determine whether they'll undermine democracy, uh, oh, well, this is the explanation, uh, let's get some actual uh, data. So here, what I did was uh, compiled a list of every Muslim majority country that experienced a democratic breakdown since 1974. And I'm defining a breakdown here as going from being a free country in Freedom House's uh, um, uh, categorization to either partially free or not free. Okay, and you know you could quibble with that. You should say, well, does going from free to partially free really count as a breakdown? Okay, maybe you're right. Um, but the point is, even when we use that, we get 15 cases. How many of these cases of democratic breakdown in the Muslim majority world were at the hands of Islamist parties that won elections and decided to dismantle democracy? Zero, none of them, okay. Then uh, this slide actually uh, uh, has a little bit more of a uh, permissive um, uh, rule. I said, okay, let's just look at every democratic decline in Muslim majority countries. So this is if you're a free country and you break down, but also if you're a partially free country and you become a, a not free country. And that gets you 71 cases of democratic decline in Muslim majority countries. Now, how many of these were arguably at the hands of Islamists? Well. Um, I, I would count three, okay? So clearly Iran, that's the one that stands out most in people's uh, minds. Then there's the military coup in Sudan in 1989, which was conducted by military officers with Islamist sympathies, although they didn't really set about erecting a theocracy and they put a lot of Islamists in jail once they got there. The, the clearest case really is Turkey, whose president Recep Tayyip Erdogan is technically an Islamist, although my view, frankly, is that he's much more uh, populist in the mold of somebody like Hungary's Viktor Orban or Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro or the Philippines' Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo Duterte. But even if we attribute Turkey's democratic backsliding under Erdogan to his Islamism, at best you've got three of 71 breakdowns in the Muslim world in the past 47 years that were at the hands of Islamists. And in fact, we have many more examples of secularists dismantling democracy in order to prevent Islamists from coming to power than we have examples of Islamists dismantling democracy in order to erect theocracy or just stay in power. I've already told you about the Algerian military in 1992, which claimed it needed to kill democracy in order to save it. And it's a story that's been repeated throughout the region. Autocrats and militaries limit freedom and they justify it by saying that Islamists are coming, and we saw that most recently in uh, Tunisia. I should say, I don't have any brief for Islamist parties. I'm personally a secularist, I'm a classical liberal, I'm a deep believer, not just in democracy, but in Western-style democracy. But there's no denying the fact that the Muslim world's card-carrying secularists are responsible for far more democratic breakdown and democratic decline than its Islamists are. Okay, before I close, I wanna step back and ask whether the question that animated this talk, are Islam and democracy compatible, is that, and, and is that why uh, you don't have any Muslim democracies, was that the right question to begin with? Because there's an assumption behind the question. The assumption is that democracy is something that we've discovered and kind of mastered here in the, uh, in the West, while it is only in the benighted Muslim world and in the world of other non-Christian religions that democracy has yet to be achieved. But I think recent political events throughout the world should make clear to us that this assumption just isn't true. In places like Hungary, Poland, and Brazil, democratic regimes are now on the ropes as populist leaders undermine freedom, pluralism, and the rule of law. And not even in the United States, with the, which is the wealthiest and most powerful of the world's democracy, is, uh, is, are we uh, in the clear. In fact, Freedom House ranks the United States 61st out of 210 countries in terms of its level of freedom, behind much younger democracies like the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Lithuania, Greece, Chile, and Taiwan. I created this slide to just give you, okay, so uh, I created this slide to give you a sense of um, democracy's uh, fortunes. This is not Freedom House data, but it's from another project that's similar to Freedom House. On the x-axis, you have the year, so we're starting in 1900, we're ending in 2020, and on the uh, y-axis, you have basically the 
level of liberal democracy. And you see there, you know, l there's been a kind of gradual increase in democracy over time. But since 2011, we start seeing a decline around the world, okay? This is the global uh, average. But if we, you can also see that this is a problem in the Western countries. So this is the same uh, uh, um, uh, data, the liberal democracy index, for just the advanced industrialized European countries. And here too, right, you see that even in the world's wealthy, advanced, and predominantly Christian countries, democracy is in trouble. And so what all of this should remind us, ladies and gentlemen, is that getting and keeping democracy are not just challenges for the world's Muslims, they're challenges for all of us. Thank you. I'll keep time as well. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, uh, uh, thanks so much to Professor Underwood and to BYU for having me. It's good to be back here. I was here at a conference two years ago. Okay, so uh, Tarek did a very good job of laying the groundwork for what I'm gonna talk about because we still have a problem, right? We haven't resolved the problem. So yes, it is true that there is a kind of global democratic decline, but there still is something unique about um, certainly the Middle East, but also more broadly about Muslim majority countries when it comes to levels of freedom and democracy. If we focus on the Middle East, there aren't any full democracies. The only two sort, sort of democracies are Iraq and Lebanon. And when you're trying to say that there's democracies in the Middle East by pointing to Iraq and Lebanon, you know you're probably not on strong ground. So there's that. Um, so we intuitively know that something is wrong. And I think we have to speak frankly about it because there has to be some sort of reason here. Why is this region, the Middle East, so profoundly undemocratic, so profoundly authoritarian, um, the Middle East is messed up. I mean, we know this, um, and it's depressing for those of us who study the region, who care about the region, who are originally from the region, so on and so forth. Um, Tarek already mentioned that there used to be a bright spot in the Middle East, uh, Tunisia, and it's, it's interesting, I'm finishing up a book, and um, I'm going, I'm editing parts of it, and I had something that said um, there are three partial or full or full democracies in the Middle East, Tunisia, Iraq, and Lebanon. And now I, I had to sort of like in track changes with the red. I just crossed out Tunisia. And it was like sad because like I was actually doing that in real time and now Tunisia is gone. So that's sort of where we're at. So what I'll try to do here as the title of our session suggests is to look at how Islam interacts with contemporary politics. And we already talked about uh, yesterday and this morning about, you know, the, Islam is a complex thing, so we can kind of put it in scare quotes sometimes. So the problem isn't Islam, or it, let's, let's put it this way, the problem isn't Islam itself. I'm gonna make a little bit of a different argument that there is a problem, and the problem is the inability to resolve the question of Islam's role in public life. The Middle East and Middle Eastern countries have not been able to resolve that foundational question of what role Islam should play and Islam's relationship to the state and the state's relationship to Islam. These are fundamental questions. They're very challenging and they remain unresolved to this day in most of these countries. So if you look at polling, not to belabor this because others have touched on it, if you look at polling, very large majorities in the Middle East say that Islam is very important in their daily lives. And I was actually going back through some of the Pew research. So the latest Pew poll on this is from 2020. And I, I had some data and I, and I read through it and I was like, this can't be right. I looked at the numbers for Tunisia. 99% of Tunisians say that God is important in their daily life. That's, like, that's pretty high. The number for prayer, which is a little bit of a different indicator, 97% of Tunisians say that prayer is important in their lives. There's a couple things to take from this. 
first and foremost, a lot of Tunisians are lying. So we know that. Because, I mean, I, uh, and I know many of them who don't actually, prayer isn't definitely not very important or important in their daily life. Anyway, this is interesting because there still is a sense of pressure that you're supposed to say if someone asks you, is prayer important to you, you're going to feel that you should say yes, even if it isn't actually important to you. I and mean, we all do this, social pressures. The reason I bring up Tunisia, because Tunisia is a little bit of an extreme, extreme case, it's probably the most secularized Arab country. So even in the most secular country, 97% of Tunisians are saying that prayer is important to them. Let's go one step further. Um, large majorities in most Arab countries say that they want Islam and Islamic law to play a prominent role in public life. In some of these countries, we're talking about 80 to 90 percent who say this. Not Tunisia, but some of the more religiously conservative countries like Egypt and Jordan and so on. So clearly what we have here is a broad popular desire to not be secular or to have Islamic law playing some kind of role. Now, the problem here is that, let's say you have uh, 50 Muslims who say they think that Sharia should play an important role in public life. And I've actually done this to some extent. Um, in my field work, I would spend a lot of time with the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood and the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood. And I would just ask them, and they're all Islamists, and they're all part of more or less the same organization. And I would ask, like, what does it mean to you to implement Sharia? And even among them, amongst themselves, they would disagree and give me somewhat, you know, fairly different answers. If you're asking Muslims more broadly, 50 Muslims, uh, what does it mean? What does Sharia mean to you? You'll get 50 quite divergent answers. You can maybe do this test with the Muslims here, and you could probably see that that would be the case amongst us as well. Now, um, so th this creates a problem because you have this desire for Islam to play this important role, but Muslims don't agree on what that role should be. So what ends up happening is that the, f the main religious, the, sorry, the main political cleavage in the Middle East is around precisely this question, what to do about Islam, what to do about Islamic law. There's disagreement, and that's what creates a divide. So what you end up having is Islamists on one hand, secularists on the other, and many shades in between. And this is obviously an oversimplification. We can have a debate about what secular means in the Middle Eastern context, and I'll talk briefly about what Islamism actually is. But the point here is that this is what people are disagreeing fundamentally about. They don't agree on the role of Islam. Now let's contrast this to say, um, so. For, if we had talked 10 years ago, I would have contrasted this, what I've just described in the Middle East, with the United States, my own country. And you might recall 10 years ago, it's a long time ago, and it's a little bit blurry for a lot of us, but in the Obama era, people were debating things like health care policy, taxes. Um, there was even this thing where um, President Obama, you might be, some of you might not remember this, uh, but he wore a tan suit, and it became an actual controversy in the media. That's, that's what we were discussing at that time. But um, what's important here is that let's take something more serious. I think healthcare policy is pretty serious, but it's tangible. You can compromise on it. You can split the middle, so to speak. But how do you split the middle? on metaphysical questions? How do you split the middle on questions around identity, culture, and religion that are hard to quantify? And that's part of the problem we have in various Arab countries. To take two examples, in the Arab Spring, in Egypt and Tunisia, um, there were big problems around um, economic inequality, around unemployment. And you would talk to ordinary people and they would raise these concerns, at least some of the time. But what was interesting is that when political parties started to organize in this period of political opening, what did they actually choose to emphasize? They didn't actually talk all that much about tax policy or health care or, or economic reform or things like that. They talked a lot about identity, culture, and religion. And a lot of those discussions had to do with the sense of gender, gender equality, role of uh, religious minorities, and what role Islam should play, um, so on and so forth. So 
that became, again, the key cleavage, and we saw that play out in the Arab Spring in these various countries. Again, the role of Islam in public life, Islam's relationship to the state, and the state's relationship to Islam. Uh, the state's relationship to Islam. Okay, so I mentioned the state here, and this is what I want to just um, dwell on for a, a second or two. The state. It's worth remembering that there wasn't always a nation state. The nation state is a relatively modern innovation. Um, it's so modern, in fact, that there are some people left in the world who were alive technically before the formal abolition of the last caliphate, which happened in 1924. So if you're 97 and you, and you live in what was previously the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, you were technically alive when there was a caliphate. But I don't think there are any Turks or really anyone left unless you're maybe 110 who will have an actual memory of what it was like to live under a caliphate. This is all to say that this only happened in the last 100 years or so, is that we have something new called the state. And I'm going to get to this in a moment. The state becomes a problem in the story that I'm telling you. But before we go into all that, I just want to say um, a couple words about Islamism and Islamists. So we, we've talked about this word yesterday and today. Um, just so we're on the same page, I'll offer a little definition, just so we know what we're talking about. It's very broad and fairly simple. Uh, Islamists are those that believe that Islam or Islamic law should play a central role in public life and politics. That's the broadest sort of umbrella definition. Now, you can kind of go into a lot more detail, but that's a good starting point. Because that's a big umbrella, we can distinguish between various kinds of Islamist group. And on the far right of the spectrum, we have violent, radical, extremist Islamists like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the ones that we hear about in the news um, the most, um, the far right. And then the vast majority of Islamists are not, though, um, Al-Qaeda or ISIS or whatever. They're what I would call mainstream Islamists in the sense that um, they, are, they are peaceful. They participate in the political process. They're gradualists, not revolutionaries. Um, they are part of their societies. They accept the nation state, however grudgingly, so on and so forth. So the most, uh, the most well known of these mainstream Islamist movements is the Muslim Brotherhood, and that's probably one that you've heard a lot about. There are Muslim Brotherhood branches and affiliates throughout the world. Um, there's even a small one here in the US, uh, or an analog to it, let's say. Um, so this is a very common thing, and um, okay. So the vast majority of Islamists are peaceful, but there's something else which I think is more interesting than this. So Islamists are often portrayed as anti-modern, but I would argue, I, this is actually a fact I would say, they are very much a product of modern life. So you can't actually understand Islamists without understanding modernity and what modernity produces. And just to be more specific about what I mean there, say you went back five centuries and you, and you had said the word Islamists, even in Arabic, the Islamiyun, um, you would have gotten blank stares five centuries ago. There was no such thing as Islamists in the pre-modern era. They did not exist. In the pre-modern era, Islam provided an overarching legal and moral architecture. It imbued everything. It went without saying, so it wasn't said. There was no reason to say that you believed Islam should play a central role in public life because it already played a central role in public life. And that was that. But then something happened. So that for the better part of 14 centuries of Islamic history, we don't have Islamists because Islam is just the way things are. For the most, uh, with very few exceptions, people don't question that overarching order. Then something happens, um, primarily in the 19th century. And then moving into the 20th century, secular ideologies are introduced, they gain traction among governing elites, and you ha and now you no longer have one vision, you have two. So as these new secular ideas gain ground, you have secular elites to generalize, um, then you have a reaction to those secular elites. So you have these groups that start to form, that start saying that they are Islamic, and they're very self-consciously Islamic. They're trying to push back 
and make Islam relevant to politics again. They're afraid that Islam is going to be privatized. If you will, they want to make Islam great again. And that could be sort of like one of the, they should, someone should use that in the Middle East, it's catchy. Um, so to put it differently, you can't have Islamists without secularists. Each relies on its opposite. Or as someone said yesterday, I think, uh, the presence of things is made more conspicuous by their absence. And the same can be said for Islam. Once you have the sense that Islam is being taken away from you, then you're going to be active in trying to reintroduce it. So here we have the Muslim Brotherhood entering into our story. Um, oldest, largest uh, Islamist movement, as I said, founded in 1928 by a school teacher. A couple interesting things about the Brotherhood, very quickly. They're very bottom up. Uh, Shireen mentioned some of this yesterday. Their vision of changing society was that you would start with yourself and your heart. You'd become a better Muslim. Then if you became a better Muslim, then you'd have a Muslim family. Um, a bunch of Muslim families would mean that you would have a bunch of Islamic communities. It would keep on going up stage by stage. If you have a more Islamic society, what happens at the end of this story? the government reflects that Islamization. And so you would think organically, the government, people who, uh, people who rule you, will also become more Islamic because they're drawing from the society itself. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, and we'll get to why. Um, also, the other thing about the Muslim Brotherhood, they're very gradualist. They're very slow, like a... Um, and I, I remember I was always amazed in talking to brotherhood leaders and activists. They never seemed to be in a rush. And they would always say things. They were exaggerating, probably. But I think there was a kernel of truth there. They would always talk about how they have a very long time horizon. And that gave them a built-in advantage. I think that's part, partly, uh, partly true. So, but basically, you have an issue here. Um, so th those, are two, those are two important aspects of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then there's the, the modernism that I mentioned just a moment ago. And um, basically what they wanted to do was to take a religion and they were asking themselves, how do we apply this religion to modern life? That is the fundamental question that the Brotherhood is asking. So in this sense, they have an interest in modernizing Islam and finding ways to make it more relevant in people's lives. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. It's not self-evident how you might do this. Part of it has to do with, okay, well, what about Islamic law? You can't find Islamic law in a book. So this is part of the challenge. As we saw yesterday, Islamic law is a rich, organic, multifaceted thing. And what is the modern way of talking about law, including in this country? Um, law is something you codify, it's something you implement, it's something you can read in law books and law manuals, you read statutes on a page, and then you apply the law. And I, the word apply is very important here, because that wouldn't have made sense in the pre-modern era. So if you want to modernize Islam, then you have to think about how to apply Islamic law in this very modern sense of coming up with rules and figuring out how to apply them. And this is why Islamists use a phrase that was not really common before, tadbi a sharia, which means the implementation or the application of sharia. You're applying something in this very specific way. So, in short, so, and there's also kind of like interesting, um, a lot of Islamists are engineers and doctors. Um, so they have a very technical way of looking at things. So this also makes sense to them that um, if you're an engineer, one plus one equals two. If you want to apply law, then you have a specific way of applying it. And, and Islamists themselves have a very interesting phrase, another phrase that they use. They talk about al-mashru' al-islami, which means the Islamic project. And that's like a weird way to talk about your religion. They talk about like, we want to have, we want to have this Islamic project and implement it. That is a fairly modern way of talking about religion. Again, it's very focused. What, 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 what do we think about when we're applying something or coming up with a project in school? It means that you're trying to do something very specific and you have a plan, a vision, so on and so forth. Okay, so if I had to sum it up, um, I would say, and this gets a little bit more to what Islamism is fundamentally about, and I think this is really important to understand, which is basically that Islamism is the attempt to reconcile pre-modern Islamic law with the modern nation state. 
at least to me, that is, that is the project of Islam more broadly. But this is a problem because it's trying to square an impossible circle. And I don't want to go into too much controversial territory here. I, um, and some people might have some disagreements with how I put this. But I would say, I think it's somewhat self-evident, that Islam wasn't designed for the modern nation state. Almost by definition, Islam was revealed in 7th century Arabia to people who didn't know what a nation state was. There were no actual nation states in the modern sense at that time. And, you know, naturally, if Islam was revealed in a different time, in a different context, where there were nation states, presumably the message would be at least somewhat different. So you have an issue here is that Islam is not, it's, it, and Islam is, as it has developed over centuries, the classical tradition that you've heard about the last two days, it didn't really develop with the nation state in mind. Okay, so this brings us back to the present moment, and here's where I'll start to kind of close up in my last um, nine minutes or so. Um, so what do you, I've, I've offered a lot to you. Now, what I'm gonna try to do here is to, is to at least tell you from my perspective what this all means today in the modern Middle East. How do we make sense of all this information? This is you know, somewhat complicated stuff. There's a long history here. Why does politics feel so existential in the Middle East, but also, for that matter, in our own country? And again, it's worth emphasizing that this, this feeling that we have, that politics is existential, that the stakes are so high, I saw that in the Arab Spring when I was living in the Middle East at the time, it's spreading throughout the world. So in some ways, the Middle East was ahead of its time. It was pointing us to our new future, one that we will all likely share, where elections are very frightening events because so much is at stake. But why is so much at stake? Why do we feel this way about our elections? Part of it is because whoever, whoever wins an election gains control of the state. So this is where I come back to the question of the modern nation state. And this state has a machinery. It has a power to it. The nation state, as we said, is relatively new. But there's also the fact that the nation state has grown tremendously powerful, especially in the last 50 years or so. It can repress and kill. Technological advances allow the state to put citizens under perpetual surveillance. The state has bloated bureaucracies, especially in the Middle East. Anyone who's lived in the Middle East will know what Middle Eastern bureaucracies are like. They employ as much as 10% of the population as public sector employees in one way or another, even if these people don't actually work, they're just kind of on the rolls. And um, so there's a lot of dependency on the state. And people look up to the state to, to be there for them to kind of provide so on and so forth. And this creates a problem. Like it's, at some level, we want states to get things done, but it also means that everyone wants control of the state machinery. So naturally, elections, if they happen in the Middle East, they feel existential because whoever, whoever wins is in a very powerful position to use the state to reshape society. So Islamists want to reshape society in their own image, obviously. Non-Islamists want to prevent Islamists from coming to power because they don't want Islamists to reshape society. So that's, that's the fundamental divide, or at least one of the fundamental divides right there. One of the major changes of the past 30 years is that mainstream Islamists, like the Muslim Brotherhood, came to accept and even embrace democracy. Not liberal democracy, but procedural democracy. The idea that you choose your leaders through elections and you rotate power every few years. Um, so they began, and they began focusing more attention and resources on elections, which they hadn't done previously because these are, is, these are Islamist movements, they're not political parties. A movement has a broader set of concerns. They care about preaching and education. They care about having parallel structures in societies where they, they build networks of institutions. So if you go to a, let's, let's take Egypt or Jordan um, and so on, you'll find that Islamist uh, movements to have a network of businesses, um, mosques, clinics, hospitals, um, even Boy Scout troops, I mean, you name it, they have this kind of, I don't want to say state within a state because that makes it sound frightening, but it's a kind of set of parallel state institutions. Okay, 
so um, at some point, basically what happened is Muslim Brotherhood movements realized that their bottom-up model wasn't going to be enough because they tried to reshape society. People did become more religious. There was an Islamic revival starting in the 70s, intensifying in the 80s, and continuing to one degree or another to this day. But then there was a there was a gap they didn't really address. So you had more Islamic societies, but that wasn't reflected in government. So Islamists started to ask themselves, how do we close that gap? The conclusion they came to is they have to contest elections seriously. And this is where we are now. So this is the problem perpetually. Every time you have a free election in the Middle East, Islamists either win or do quite well. And then this provokes counter reactions from those who are afraid of Islamists coming to power. So we're at an impasse. And um, as I finish here, I will at least try to offer a couple options of what we do about, and I just mean we in the, the royal sense. I mean, there's not a whole lot we can do here, although America does play a role. I don't want to go into that too much because it's a little bit a field from what we're talking about. But if we, who, who's afraid of Islamists coming to power in the Middle East? Secularists in these countries are, but also a lot of other people. A lot of people don't like Islamist parties for legitimate reasons. But it's not just Arabs themselves in these societies who oppose Islamists coming to power. The U.S. also does. And Tariq alluded to this briefly, that in the case of Algeria was a very obvious one, where the U.S., France, and others did support the military coup. Um, part of what I'm working on now in, in this new book is it goes into a lot of detail about how the Obama administration, in, in my view, uh, based on my argument, um, gave what amounted to a green light to the um, Egyptian military to undo election results and to stage a coup. That happened in 2013, as many of you might know. The Brotherhood had come to power through free elections, and, and then they were un ousted uh, about a year later. Okay, so what do we do about this impasse? Part of the problem, part of the many problems that, I'm, that I've been discussing is that you can't stop Islamists from being Islamists, and you can't stop ordinary people from voting for Islamists except through force, except through coercion. Um, and even then, it's very difficult to do. But also from a normative perspective, as those of us here, um, mostly Americans, but also I assume most people here believe in some modicum of democracy or like some basic rights, we probably have normative objections to using coercion to force people to be something they don't want to be. So that option isn't ideal. A lot of people like that option in the Middle East using force, but we probably want to avoid it. Um, and, you know, and I don't want to go too much into, like, what I saw happen in Egypt, but most of my, uh, most, I'm, I'm born and raised in Pennsylvania, but uh, my parents are, are originally Egyptian. Most of my relatives are still there. Most of my family, some of whom are very nice, dear people, some of whom I, I love, some of them. Um, they, there was a massacre that happened after the military coup that I just mentioned in August 2013. About a, more than 1,000 people were killed in broad daylight by the military. Um, most of my family supported that massacre and were re relatively open with me about how they thought this was a good thing. I don't want to go into um, what was exactly going into their mind. I will just say that you can be an otherwise good person and support evil things. We know this throughout history. They thought the stakes were too existential and they said it's either us or them. You and your Americans with your democracy talk, we're the ones who have to live in this country. And you know what? This is probably bad, but it's it's what has to happen. That's the kind of thinking that people can use to justify. Um, so what's the alternative to that, to what my family in Egypt, what they thought about this massacre, coercion, all of this? That's one way of doing it. The second way, uh, the alternative, and as you can guess, this is, <laughs> this is the choice that I lean towards. The alternative is to try to accommodate Islam's role in public life. And sometimes that means accommodating Islamists in public life. That doesn't mean we have to like Islamists. And on things that I think many of us as Americans care about, gender equality, uh, minority rights, um, we might think that some of what Islamists believe is, is bad, beyond the pale, very disturbing. So it's fine to dislike groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and even dislike them quite strongly. 
But our personal preferences in this regard, I would argue, are irrelevant because bad people are allowed to contest elections. It happens in this country, as we know. Bad people are part of elections everywhere, almost, that there are democratic elections. So you can't just say that, oh, they're bad, therefore we can't, um, we can't have them participate. And this is where it really gets to a fundamental question about how we understand the democratic idea. Democracy at its core is about reflecting popular preferences. So if 80% of people want some aspect of Islam to play a role in politics, then a democratically elected government should be able to reflect that. That's what democracies do. And that means that Muslims, like everyone else, they have the right to make the wrong choice. And I think that's a big part of what democracy is about, and it will become probably an even bigger part of democracy in the years and decades to come, unfortunately. Um, but the thing is, it's in the eye of the beholder. One person's, um, one person's wrong choice is another person's right choice, and we can't necessarily agree on that, even in this country. Some people think that one party is very good, the, other people think that party is very bad. And that is for democracy to survive in places that are ideologically polarized. At some level, you have to come to terms with the possibility that your opponents, your adversaries, even your enemies might win. And they might legitimately be in power for years to come. There's no way to get around that. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, to both Tarek and Shadi. We are now going to proceed for about 20 minutes for a conversation and invite uh, both of you to come up to our chairs over here. I'm also going to invite uh, John Esposito from Georgetown University and Ambassador Deborah Jones, the former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Kuwait and Libya. Uh, wow, we have a lot of richness uh, in uh, our comments today, and uh, it spurred many questions on, on my part. Um, the way that we'll proceed is, is I'm just going to, to share three questions, one for Tarek, one uh, for Shadi, uh, and one for both of you. And then uh, before you answer that, I'm going to turn um, to um, Ambassador Jones and to Professor Esposito. And if, if you would also be willing to share some thoughts or questions that you have. Uh, and then we'll leave at least 10 minutes uh, for both of you to respond uh, to any of those questions that you, you would like to, okay? So uh, first for you, Tarek. Uh, you, I think, con convincingly illustrated that there are two wrong answers to your core puzzle, which is why there are so few free and fair democracies in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, give us the right answer, please. Um, uh, and uh, uh, for you, Shadi, uh, you, you provided one potential arena of investigation for that answer, which is this ongoing tension between uh, citizens in these countries about the role of Islam in public life and the way that that creates challenges for democracies and, and creates sometimes existential elections. So um, I, I think you, you've helped us think through one potential scenario as to why democracy is difficult. Uh, you hinted at the end that uh, there is a, a path forward for incorporating Islam in, in public life and in political life. And I would uh, invite you to think a little bit about the next decade, perhaps, in the Middle East or, for, or, or beyond, as to how you might envision pathways in which that would happen, given our current political structures in the region. Um, and then for both of you, as, as you wish, uh, you made a, a case that uh, Muslims uh, can very, uh, much be Democrats in the small d sense, right? That they really um, have an interest in democracy. I, I invite you to speak a little bit about Islam and pluralism. So if, if uh, one of the components of Western-style liberal democracy is, is a pluralistic 
view that people of all identities, religions, and backgrounds have an equal role in shaping that society. Uh, do you see um, an equal amount of support for pluralism in Muslim-majority societies, or is that a different kind of challenge? Uh, Ambassador Jones. Yeah, I was wondering if I had a lot of the same questions and um, a lot of thoughts about what you said and wanted to confirm in Libya when we were trying to negotiate uh, with uh, different groups. Um, and Tarek Mitri had spent six months negotiating with about 40 or 50 different political elements. And at the end of the day, they agreed on three things. One, that they wanted a government that was somewhat presidential in nature. That they, two, that they did not want a strong central authority, as they had suffered under Gaddafi. But three, that they all agreed across the board that Sharia was an acceptable basis for constitutional law. And I would note here, too, that a lot of our laws in the United States are based on Judeo-Christian uh, our precepts as well. So before anyone gets all uppity about having religion in it, let's stop and think. But the second thing I was hoping, and maybe you, Tark, because you're a colleague, but both of you or either of you, I always remember Rami Khoury's rather um, concise analysis of what had happened in the Arab Spring, so-called, why it had erupted in the places it had and not in others. And he came up with two elements that he felt were present in each of the places where that had emerged. One was the question of humiliation of populations through repression, through uh, absence of, of, of non-sharing of, of uh, national assets, national wealth, and corruption. And the second one was the issue of legitimacy. In other words, that in the GCC monarchies, and even in Jordan, poor Jordan, and even in poor Morocco, where people accepted the legitimacy of the ruling state, of the rulers and their lineage, um, and did not have, even if they had some issues with the other aspect, they did not overthrow. But in the republics, where you had both issues of humiliation and a question of legitimacy, whether it was Ben Ali, you know, Muammar Gaddafi, Saleh, or uh, Hosni Mubarak, you had the, uh, the, uh, the blast and the overthrow. <clears throat> Can you hear this okay? I thought your third question was excellent, except that what you did is frame it the way we always frame it, which is we talk about our theory uh, and we ask, uh, can Muslims do X? I would say that looking at politics in this country in the last 10 years, we can no longer simply cite our theory. We're you no know, better than many, and I think the fact that we rank 61 is, um, you know, is important. I think that with regard to the future, the question that I have is, I, see, I think there is a problem with secularists, but there are certain kinds of secularists. You know, I mean, you know, the people that are the elite secularists that have a lot to lose. The fact is, what I see is that authoritarian governments have become even more authoritarian. And so, and in doing that, and in the way that they have their power, and in the way that they're uh, using it, and w especially with the role of, let's say, the UAE and the Saudis, et cetera, uh, it's lockdown time. I mean, really lockdown time. And, and the US and the EU have a track record of going along with that. And again, we'll continue to have governments within Europe and in the US talk hypocritically, but still opt in their international policies to, in fact, support what regimes are doing. And many of those governments right now in Europe, as in America, are when it comes to dealing with Muslim minorities, also quite getting quite authoritarian. The last comment is, is a really interesting one, which is, you know, when we, we again, what we often fall into is um, um, either saying this from a secular point of view, but again, we define secularism as necessarily secular liberalism, which is nice, but I would say there are multiple modernities, possibilities of that. And we need to realize that, and we're going to be challenged even more in our own society, because the data shows that in the last 10 years, uh, in addition to the emergence uh, or greater growth, the last 15 of the Christian right, Roman Catholics have now become part of the Christian right. Uh, and so <laughs> in terms of their approach to the idea that we're a country based on political and religious pluralism, and that's the criterion, I find in conversations with folks, they do that all the time. 
But, you know, what Gallup found is, for example, something like 44% of evangelicals believed our laws should be based on the Bible. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you talk to a conservative Catholics, and you don't even have to talk to them, you just have to read what their bishops and cardinals, many of them are saying, vis-a-vis their pope, um, we're in for one hell of a ride for the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, I probably won't be here in 20 years. I may want to live that long, but I mean, I think the next 10 or 20 years, and I think what's really concerning to me is this was unimaginable for many of us until, until a very short time ago, that, that everything would unravel in the, in the same way that I look at Palestine and Israel now. It almost looks like you're gonna to have to have a really long term to figure out you know, what's gonna really happen. I just have to add a postscript because John brought up the whole idea of the Uyghurs and this and that. It's there's been the U.S. Are, and European countries are not the only ones who have something to answer for in silence on behaviors because there has been, uh, you know, an incredible, a resounding silence on the Uyghurs from a number of the Arab states and the GCC countries who work with China. Um, thanks to both of you for, for your comments, and as time permits, uh, feel free to, to, to jump back in. And thank you very much for problematizing um, pluralism as a Western notion, which, in fact, we all struggle with and, and, uh, and recognize as a, as a contemporary challenge. So, Tarek, uh, your thoughts. So, thank you. There's a, a lot on the table, and I don't want to um, uh, uh, filibuster, but, you know, your tough question at the outset, which is, okay, Masood, you told us what's the wrong answer, what's the right answer— the first thing I would say is I actually don't know. Nobody really knows. But if you, um, I think the standard structural variables in our accounts of democratization explain the Muslim lack of democracy just fine, right? These are countries, aside from the oil rich countries, that are middle and lower middle income countries. And you kind of expect them to not be fully fledged democracies of the type that you see in the wealthiest countries of the world. So I think the structural variables frankly explain it all. You could still sneak religion into that. And f- and for those who, who don't understand oh, what you oh, mean sorry. by structural variables. I mean basically poor countries tend not to be able to keep democracy. So it turns out that countries become democracies, authoritarian regimes become democracies quite regularly. But then their democracies break down and it scholars have kind of identified that if you're a rich country and you become a democracy, you'll stay a democracy. If you're a poor country and you become a democracy, think like a place like Mali, for example, um, you're very likely to have your democracy break down. And that's typically because of you know distributional struggles or because the state is very weak and so you've got a new democracy, but life is kind of crummy and people say, oh, you know what, let's just have the military come in and take over. So there's a long literature that basically tries to explain explain democracy as a function of your level of economic development. And I think that literature does very, very, very well. Now, you could still implicate Islam in that. And there are a lot of scholars who say, well, the reason that many Muslim countries are not wealthy is because of Islam. But I I don't go there. I don't think you need to go there. the, The point I was merely trying to make, though, is that this set of arguments that locates the cause of democratic failure in Muslims or in Islamist groups uh, doesn't seem to be uh, quite right. I I have thoughts on the other things, but I want to let Shadi speak. Yeah, okay. So so it's worth contrasting Arab countries with some South and Southeast Asian countries. So Tariq did mention that if we're talking about full democracies uh, as classified by Freedom House, we don't really have many options. But if we're talking about democracies without the adjective of fully free or full or liberal, we do have some, I would say, relatively positive examples. Um, Indonesia is probably the most well-known one, the most populous Muslim-majority country in the world. Malaysia, not exactly, but it still has some partial democratic aspects. Pakistan, not a model for anyone, but at least there are there is some electoral competition. Um, so if you take those three examples, what do they have that the Middle East uh, doesn't have? Um, different colonial histories, first of all, different role of the U.S. in terms of either propping up or undermining certain kinds of regimes. And I can and I do want to emphasize that in the moment, but also but also something else 
that in those three countries, Islamist parties are normalized and the role of Islam in public life is normalized. So you don't really have powerful secular elites who are saying Islamists have to be banned. Everyone takes it for granted that Islamists and Islamism are going to be part of, of public life. But I, I am someone who definitely puts a lot of focus on international factors. So if you heard me in a different talk, I would have gone on about that. Um, for a longer period of time. I do see the U.S. as maybe not decisive, maybe that's a, too strong of a word, but a very important player. The U.S. for decades now, this is not just during the latter part of the Arab Spring, it's not just in the last 20 years, really for the last several decades, the U.S. has undermined democracy wherever it has, has uh, bore its head, even a little bit, the U.S. has basically fought fought against it to one degree or another, and the U.S. is very influential in the Middle East. We have a lot of leverage with certain kinds of regimes, and we indulge them endlessly. So this goes and uh, this goes to Quinn's question: How do I see the next um, the next period? Um, I'm, well, first of all, I should just say, like, I, I started to adopt a much darker view of human nature the more I lived in the Middle East. And the Arab Spring really left a sour taste in my mouth. And I don't, I don't actually want to live in the Middle East again. Maybe I'll change my mind. But it was like a very dark period. And I think there's a, there's a sadness that all of us feel. And it's also when you see, like I said, otherwise good people kind of losing their mind and having this bloodlust. You know, it's not because they're Arab. It's not because they're Muslim. But it's still hard to take. So I think um, that darkness sort of like colors how I view the, the Middle East. Um, I think also repression works. It doesn't work forever. There's a limit. It can work very well for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if, so, for example, if you look at um, the mass killings and the civil war in Algeria, which started in 1992, we can ask ourselves, how long did it take for Algerians to recover from that trauma and start a revolution or an uprising. So 1992 until 2018. So um, that's when Algeria had its sort of its own Arab Spring. Uh, that's my math, 26 years. I hope it doesn't take 26 years for Egyptians to recover from their coup, from their mass killing. It could. But even if it's less, we're still talking about 15, 20 years. It's not as if we're going to see another revolution right away. It's possible, and I have a hope that a black swan will make itself apparent, but I'm not going to pretend that I can predict that because you, by definition, you can't really predict black swans. But I do believe that authoritarian regimes are, by definition, they are temporary because not to get all like, you know, um, uh, dramatic, melodramatic, and say that everyone has a desire to be free and things like that. But I do think there is something about authoritarianism that sort of, it, it sort of, um, it violates very fundamental things about who we, who we are. I guess I do believe that in the end. That doesn't mean that we all want to be free in a Western sense or we all want to be liberals, but I think it is fair to say that most people want to have some freedom to make their own choices. Now, we might not like the choices they make. They might vote for socialists, communists, Islamists, Salafis, not liberals. They're voting for a lot of things that we as Americans may not like, but they still want to choose their own representatives in this kind of minimal sense. I think it's very hard to just like, um, to destroy that. You can destroy the spirit of a people for a certain period. I don't believe you can destroy the spirit of a people indefinitely. And that's why in the broader, in, across the broader sweep of history, people do tend to revolt. Now, it might not work out, but there is a sense that we don't want you, we don't want to live this way with you. We might want to try someone else who's still kind of repressive, but, you know, so I, th I think that over time we will see a change. I just don't know how long uh, it's going to take. And it does depend, at least in part, on the role the U.S. plays. That's why I'm very vocal about how the U.S. should do should atone for its sins of the past, if you will, and do at least a better job. It's not going to be perfect, but at least try to prioritize these values a little bit more. Um, 
And I'm not encouraged by what I've seen from the Biden administration, despite, as you said, I mean, all of the rhetoric where Biden has talked about the fight between democracies and autocracies is the central struggle of our time. He's been terrible on democracy in the Middle East. I don't want to go through the list, but he's been terrible. He doesn't, I mean, don't, yeah, don't get me started. Yeah. Um, Tarek. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the question that you asked about where where is the region going, that's a really hard question. Um, I'll point out one kind of um, development that you see happening in the region, and it kind of validates, I think, Shetty's view of the, of, of the region. I actually, uh, uh, you know, I think disagree slightly, ever so slightly with him. But what you're seeing in a lot of these uh, countries is, is a uh, thorough attempt by the states to remake citizens. And so you're now seeing these, you know, newfangled education programs and public curricula that are trying to refashion the citizen. And they're trying to do a couple of things. They're trying to make them more productive, you know, more likely to go into the workforce and actually do things. But they're also trying to make them less vulnerable, well, I'm using the, the language that they might use, less vulnerable to being seduced by Islamists. And so, for example, you have the very interesting phenomenon in Saudi Arabia, they now teach Western philosophy in public school. Right. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. The idea that you would learn Western philosophy in school in Saudi Arabia, I still can't quite wrap my mind around. In in the United Arab Emirates, they have a moral education curriculum that is explicitly divorced from religion. And, um, in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, they have something called a critical thinking curriculum that is designed not necessarily to inculcate critical thinking, but to uh, it d definitely designed to make people skeptical of or resistant to uh, religious political actors and the appeals of religious political actors. So now, on, on one hand, you know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm torn about these things because as a you know, good liberal, I would like people to learn Western philosophy in Saudi Arabia. I would like them to learn Western philosophy in Egypt in the context of a democracy and not necessarily in the context of a repressive state where a certain segment of the political landscape is forcibly excised from politics. But it's possible, not likely, but it's possible that you know some of these changes, some of the economic reforms that are at least being talked about, might actually get you in 10, 20, 30 years a society that has a kind of bigger middle class in which some of these issues of religion, um, the temperature around them has been lowered such that a democratic transition in, and, and this really only applies to the Arab countries, I think, but such that a democratic transition might be possible. I wouldn't hold my breath for such an outcome, but that's something I'm looking at. Um, please join me in uh, thanking our discussants today for a really rich conversation. Thank you.